Let's take a moment and pray together. God, we give you thanks for everything that you've given us. And we just pray that as we think together about the scripture and what it means in our lives, that you might be at work here in our hearts, our minds, and our hearing, and in our understanding. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. People will talk about how science looks for the answers to our biggest questions. I mean, like practical things. For example, how could we reverse aging, right? That would be a practical thing. It would be very helpful. To things more theoretical, like is time travel possible? Maybe some of the deepest things that humans can ponder about our origins. You know, how did the universe come to be? There are limits, of course, to the questions that science can answer. Still can't figure out where all the socks go that I lose in the dryer, right? Nobody knows that. Can't figure it out. But I'm convinced, though, that the biggest questions that exist don't really belong to the realm of science. That the biggest questions that we face really are very squarely in the realm of philosophy or theology. Questions like, what's the meaning of life? or even larger than the question of how the universe came to be, the question of why did the universe come to be? Or put another way, the question of why is there something and not nothing? Why is there anything? I mean, there's nothing that says that any of this, the universe, this planet, you and me, None of this has to be here, and yet it is. And so for me, that kind of begs the question, well, why? Why is it here? That question, why something and not nothing, I don't want to say it was first asked, but it was maybe first popularized by a German mathematician and scientist and philosopher named Leibniz. He's often given credit for a lot of different things, including the invention of calculus in the 17th century. He went beyond the questions that other people were asking about you know, all the how questions about how the universe came to be to ask this one that I believe is the most fundamental one of all, which is why something and not nothing. Now, I know that this is a strange way to start a new series, and especially one about generosity and giving, but I hope that you'll hear me out because this is the starting point for me. I began to reflect on things related to Leibniz's question from a surprisingly early age. And probably, in part, that's what drove me to become a pastor. I mean, we are here. Even though we didn't have to be here. And so this morning, every morning, before we ever put our feet on the floor, we have already experienced this great gift the gift of just being alive, of just being in this world. And so if you ask a theologian why something and not nothing, the theologian answers, well, because God decided that there should be something. That there should be. That it's needed. That it's what God wanted. And so God created. That's what we teach. We teach that God created the light and the darkness, the land and the sea, the sun and the stars, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and finally you and finally me, all of us together. There's this meme, and you've probably seen it. It says, how cool is it that the God who created the mountains and the oceans and the galaxies looked at you and thought, we need one of you too. And that, my friends, is the thing that we in the church call grace. The idea of blessings that we didn't expect and things that we did not deserve, like love and kindness and forgiveness, that are poured into our life. Grace is amazing because it has this capacity to surprise us. All the ways that God loves and cares for us when we, at the very, are at our moment where we least expect anything good to happen are those moments of amazing and surprising grace. And if you've ever experienced loss or tragedy or challenge or difficulty or grief in your life, and you're still here in church, 
then you probably already know that. That's probably the reason why you are still here in church. But not only is grace amazing, it's also saving. It's saving because it literally has the power to pull us out of the depths of despair by reminding us that we are worth something. Even when the people around us, even when maybe we ourselves are convinced otherwise. The good news of the gospel is that God loves you enough to die for you. So you matter to God. And not just a little bit, but a whole lot you matter to God. When I hear the words of Psalm 8, I immediately feel this kinship with the writer. It seems to me that they share kind of my love for these philosophical types of questions. So listen to this. What are human beings that you think about them? What are human beings that you pay attention to them? In other words, God, why is it that you bother with us? Why is it that you care? Surely the sovereign over all the universe could find better, more important ways to occupy their time. I mean, surely the God who created everything could find or form others who would be more trustworthy in caring for the creation, in the words of the psalm, in ruling over God's handiwork. When I look up at your skies, at what your fingers made, the moon and the stars that you set firmly in place, when I look up, these are the things that I wonder about, and I wonder why God bothers with us. The point that I'm trying to make today is that life is a gift. And I know that that is not groundbreaking. I know that that is not new news. Almost nothing that's ever said in any pulpit anywhere is groundbreaking or new news. Because we have the same story that we've been telling in the church for 2,000 years. And the story was told for thousands of years before that. So it's cliche, it's uninteresting to us. We say, yeah, yeah, I know that. Life is a gift. But do we actually know that? Because here's the thing, it's only uninteresting to us because we so consistently forget it. We so consistently forget that it's true. We forget God's grace toward us. And we forget, let's be honest, because often life doesn't feel all that much like a gift. We get hurried and we get worried and we get overwhelmed by a list of demands that we don't think that we're ever going to be able to meet that doesn't ever seem to end. And so we wake up and again we drag ourselves out of bed when in reality all we want to do is have another hour of sleep and we go about doing the next thing that's required of us and making it through another day. Is it any wonder that we ask? What are human beings that you are mindful of them? Because most days we feel like not much. Because we're wondering not just why God would be mindful of us, but if God is mindful of us, if God thinks very much about us at all. And it's only occasionally, and I mean very occasionally, that we might remember the next verse, which is, You've made them only slightly less than divine, crowning them with glory and grandeur. In other translations, it says, you've made them only a little lower than the angels. Now, there are times when we do feel this. There are moments when to be human is absolutely amazing. It's sublime. And I feel that when I think about some of the things that God has gifted us with the skills and the intellect and the courage to do in the history of humankind. I didn't know this, but at the time of the Apollo 11 mission, you know Apollo 11 was the first to put humans on the moon. Leaders of many nations were asked to submit greetings that would be engraved on a, a special disc that was left on the moon's surface. And so the Pope, on behalf of Vatican City, submitted the text of Psalm 8 that we read today. It's on the moon. And even today, when I 
read about that 50 odd years later, you know, an event that happened a few years before I was born, I can't help but think about and be moved by the unbelievable beauty of that idea that we could have done that, that humans could have done that. When you look at the photos of the earth as seen from the moon and the courage it took for people to get there, when you think about that, when you ponder it, it's almost unimaginable that that's a possibility. Buzz Aldrin's uh, faith is a well-known dimension of his personality. In fact, he went so far as to put in his kind of personal effects that he was allowed to take to the moon, he, w he put communion that had been blessed at his church here on earth. And he took it to the moon and received communion as one of the first acts that any human did on another planetary body. It was the first liquid, the communion wine was the first liquid that was poured on the moon. But other astronauts that followed, they spoke of these profound moments of peace and the sense of God's presence in looking back at Earth from this cold rock out in the middle of space. And I have to imagine that those who look into that vast darkness can't help but feel their own smallness and can't help but ask some of these questions I started with. You know, what are human beings that you're mindful of them? Why is it that we're here at all? Why does any of this exist? How did I get here? Why is there something and not nothing? And when you experience something that is truly transcendent, then you ask those kinds of questions. You're overwhelmed. We're overwhelmed in the face of God's love for us. And you can easily remember in those moments that life is a gift. That's not hard. But there's a problem. And the problem is that you only get but so many of those truly transcendent moments in your life. You only get but so many. If you think about it, whether it's uh, a new love, a new baby, a dream job, a place that you've always wanted to visit and you finally get there, I don't know what that moment would be for you in your life. No, but as I list off those things, you know, some of us want one or more of those things and probably will never experience one or more of those things. And so if you are going to wait for those things to happen, to accept God's gift of amazing and saving grace, then you're going to spend a lot of your life being starved of a full understanding of how God has actually blessed you and what God actually does for us. You'll be deprived of the ability to see how God is actually at work in your life. Because we think that those things are God's greatest gifts, but that's not actually the case. The greatest gift is that we are here at all. That is the greatest gift. The fact that God is mindful of us. The fact that God cares for us. And that's where generosity and gratitude and faith begin is with a recognition that everything is a gift. Not just some things, not just some moments, but all things in all moments, that it's all a gift to us. And so this week, when you feel frustrated, when you feel exhausted, when you feel like you're not 100% sure what you're doing or why you're doing it or why it matters, when life this week feels like just putting one foot in front of the other and getting through the day, I want you to tell yourself this. I'm here because God thought it was important for me to be here. I'm here because God thought it was important for me to be here. And see if that doesn't remind you that everything, and I mean everything, is a gift. Let's pray together. 
God, we thank you for not only those transcendent moments in our lives, those moments when no matter how hardened we are, we recognize your presence. We thank you not only for those moments, but for all the moments. Even the times when you feel far away, even the times when we feel frustrated. God, we thank you that it is your will and your pleasure that we be here that we be here to experience this world that you've given us, that we're here to be in relationship with each other, that we're here to bless and to serve and love one another. And so we pray that you might remind us that we are here because you want us to be here. Amen.